today we are here to celebrate with a celebrated actor who's appeared in over 200 roles on both primetime television and feature film. Uh, you know him best as his roles of Gimli from Lord of the Rings and as Sala from the Indiana Jones movies. Please give a warm welcome to John Rice Davies! Yes, it's, it's lovely to be back in Phoenix and to be uh, melting quietly. <laughs> but, um, yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, there's an awful lot of you in there. Have you nothing better to do with the <laughs> So, um, I suppose, I, it, this is meant to be a panel, isn't it? You're meant to be asking me questions and things like that. But, before we start, let me bore you all with my latest semi-comprehension of important things. Right. Why are young people screwed up? <laughs> I think after 70 years of self-analysis, um, I understand why. It is because when the human growth spurt starts, the, 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 the adolescent growth spurt starts, all the bones of the body start to grow. You get longer legs and things like that. But your skull also grows. And the brain inside has to adapt to fit a new, bigger box. And it's partly growing, but very much a, a question of, of reaccommodating itself inside. And that doesn't happen overnight. It happens roughly between the ages of 24 and 26. <laughs> now the last two areas that grow, that, that are, enter their fine adult form, are areas around the prefrontal cort cortex that relate to judgment and a sense of proportion. <laughs> and uh, the amygdala, which is the sort of source and seat of raw emotions, fear, anger, despair, and all those things. So, it's really not much point in talking to a 14-year-old boy and saying, why, for a dare, did you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge? <laughs> Didn't you realize that it wasn't a smart thing to do? The answer is, of course, no, because he hasn't got the brain into a sort of position and in a condition where he can make judgments. And I think the consequences of this are, are very interesting because, of course, what we tend to do uh, with these young people that we now know from observation and science have no judgment. We allow them to drive. <laughs> we allow them to marry. We allow them to vote, and at the age of 21, we allow them to drink. In England, it's about 15. <laughs> so here's my thesis. Here's my thesis. We now know that adolescence lasts a lot longer than we ever did think, or did believe. And perhaps we as a society ought to be caring for our adolescents far better and, and, and for far more intensively uh, than we ever did before. And, and, and that will really, it's a, a real pain in the butt, because let me tell you as a parent, you really hope that by the time they're 18, they're off your hands and, uh, and you don't have to worry anymore. Uh, let me tell you as a parent of a 45 year old, a 43 year old, and an eight year old, you never stop worrying about for but, but um, if, if, you, if those of you who are 26 plus or 30, just think, look back now on the daft things that you were doing a few years ago. Do, do, 
do you see any difference in your behavior, in, in your sense of judgment? Because it isn't a question of, of, of well, of course, I'm very mature for my years or anything. Like that. <laughs> it is quite simply the brain isn't ready yet. And if we believe that, and I think the evidence is there, though I, I'm perfectly prepared to change my opinions with new facts for medical people there, um, we really ought to be looking at things the way we do things differently. Because there's far too many child suicides, depression, and things like that. And just to throw in one other thing, um, the cannabis debate. When I was at university, we all believed the wacky tobacco did you no harm at all. Mind you, the wacky tobacco that we smoked was a thirtieth or a fortieth uh, of, the, uh, of the strength of, of, of what's available to you guys. Now, if you think of that cascade, that sequential cascade of chemical reactions that's taking place within each cell as it adapts to this, it, it, as it basically shifts the brain around inside the new box. The last thing that you would want to be doing would be to add psychotropic drugs or cannabinoids into those equations. I think the consequence of what we know about the way the brain develops means that we really have to be far more cautious about letting young people experience drugs. If I took, if I suddenly decided that wacky tobacco was a new way of life for me now, you could measure the drop in my intelligence and it would only be about one or two IQ points. And when I gave up, it would bounce back. Because I'm an old man, I'm well over the age of 30. But if you, there's something called the Dunedin Longitudinal Study about, they've been following people born in 1971-72 in New Zealand. And, and the consequences of early drug use are really horrifying. And we're talking about eight to 10 IQ points lost permanently. That, you might as well just stick a hot poker in their brains and scramble around for a bit. So, I suppose this is a sort of old man's remonstrance or plea or uh, cautionary note um, that, that, that I put out to you today just, just because I wanted to talk about it, that's all. Now we can talk about other things if you like. Those of you that want to ask John a question, please line up. We have Bree, who's our line moderator, and John, who's our line moderator. They will filter your questions, so go ahead and line up. As a first question while they're lining up, you've played many diverse roles throughout your acting career, over 200. What has been your favorite role that you've performed and played? Well, that's very simple. The next one. You see, the great thing about being an actor is the uncertainty. It's either the great thing or the terrifying thing. One day the phone will stop ringing. I won't know that I've done my last job. It's just that gap would have sort of grown bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, it's just very slack. I haven't heard from the agent in two years, but I think they're still alive. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure something will turn up. You never know when it's over. And, uh, and for some people, that measure of uncertainty breeds an insecurity that they find crucified absolutely eviscerates them. I've always treated it the other way around. I'm assuming that when the next job finishes, uh, that will be it. It's over. And, uh, and so I'm going to go into it and enjoy it and have fun and try and be a decent human being for once or twice in my life, you know, and, and, and go out on a swan song. And, uh, and surprisingly enough, when you, when you adopt that, that attitude, there is a future. There is another phone call or an invitation. And, uh, and the next job is actually Hieroglyph, which is a new series for Fox set in ancient Egypt. Um, uh, 
which is a mixed blessing because we were meant to be in production now and they put it off till September, which screws up the chance of playing St. Peter that I carefully line up for the end of the year and may actually prevent me from doing the part of a lifetime, which is uh, a miniseries set in Malta on the siege of Malta in, in 1570, 1569, 1570, which is one of the great turning points of history. Um, and uh, I was hoping that I was going to play uh, uh, Jean de Valette, grandmaster, monster, bully, lecher, inspired leader. Um, but that may not happen now because of the late start of this wretched series. <laughs> Fox, thank you so much. Go ahead. Uh, I absolutely loved your rendition of Gimli. I don't really like the two, the Lord of the Rings movies very much, but Gimli, I love Gimli. I love how you did him. Can you tell any stories about working with the people in Lord of the Rings? <coughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for that. I like Gimli. He's, he's such a lot of fun, isn't he? Um, and I think the secret of his appeal uh, is that he takes himself very seriously. You know, he doesn't realize he's short. It, it may not have escaped anybody else that he is actually vertically challenged a bit, but, uh, but as far as he's concerned, you know, he's... He's a giant amongst giants, and bigger than most around him, you know. Um, when Peter Jackson was discussing how we would play things with the whole cast, you know, the point was made, um, not just by me, that there was no humor in the film. I mean, it's not a very funny film, added to which it's not got a filmic structure. You know, if you want to paraphrase of really what Lord of the Rings is about, you know, is things are good and then something bad happens and then, you know, something a bit worse happens and then actually things get quite grim. And, and you know, and then there's a bit of a fight and, and then things get worse and there's a skirmish followed not long after by a really nasty battle and then, and you know, it's sort of it, the mood sort of just goes down like that. Uh, well, you can't make a film quite like that. Um, and one of the things that we decided we would do with, uh, with Gimli was uh, to make him, as it were, the, the lightning rod for the tension. Uh, you know, when things were getting immensely tense, you know, there would be this um, yeah, this small, belligerent, bloody-minded, uh, egotistical, paranoid, little, you know, little fellow this high, <laughs> making his observations about the world. Huh? But actors sometimes fall in love with their characters. Actually, most actors fall in love with all their characters, really. Uh, but I, I'm very fond of Gilby. I think he's, uh, he's yes, I, th I think he would be up there among my, my favorite characters. Um, I really try to avoid that question because I have not, no, no, no real new answers to give you, actually. But, but um, uh, anyone else got another question? Oh, look, there's a line of people. Saved. There's, uh, there's no one lined up on this side, so you can go ahead. Oh, I see. That's the way they get you, man. <laughs> Hi. Oh, um. <coughs> Handicapped. Right. Welcome to Phoenix, sir. Oh, hello. <laughs> That's the way oh, they get you, man. Oh, I just yeah, want to say love your work as uh, Gimli in the Lord of the Rings series and also Sully in Raiders of the Lost Ark and Indiana Jones' Last Crusade. I was just wondering, you know, 
so much of the diversity in your roles. Uh, a lot of the preparation and doing some of the more action-based sequences, like, you know, when you're, you know, playing Gimli, you're obviously playing someone with a shorter stature. You do that really, that wobble really good as a dwarf, but then swing the axe around. And then uh, from doing also your work as Sully, uh, riding the camels, riding the horses, did you do much of that stuff work? Pardon well, I, 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 I can actually, um, I can ride. Though my daughter doubts that. She's eight and she's an expert horsewoman and clearly father here clearly knows nothing. Um, I, I have to show her one or two of the movies sometime, I think. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you try and do as much as you can. There are, there are times when what no one quite realizes is that film is a dangerous industrial environment. Uh, and and just because you're carried along with the magic of being on a film set with great stars and great directors and things like that does not relieve you of the responsibility of actually thinking and making judgments. In the end, it always comes down to judgment. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there are times when you look at a setup and you say, yep, fine, I can do that. You, the, the risk is, is minimal and you know you've calculated the odds and you've gone through all the props and things like that that you need you know there's not going to be a major job doing it but there are times when you when you go and think you know what the risk reward ratio here isn't smart i remember i was doing a show and i got an idea it might have been Gosh, I think, I think it was probably the Untouchables or something like that. Anyway, the idea is that we are, it is night time. We, the van pulls up, the doors open, there's a little bit of illumination inside the van. We jump out, we spin, and we, actually me, we run towards the house, and just about the time we get to the fence of the house, the house blows up. So we, we're doing this in little bits and pieces. So we've done the uh, we've done the jump out a few times. We've done the close ups and this sort of thing. And now it's time for the the master shot with the, the house blowing up. At which point I say, I tell you what, this is time for the stunt man. And um, there's a young director there, and he said, Why? And I said, Well, look, I tell you what. I, I had a plane crash in 1985, and I've been jumping out of this van now for the last half hour, and this broken leg here is aching to me. Beside which, you know, this is going to be seen on a 20-inch television set, or a 22-inch television set. You know, it's night time, it's a wide shot, you've got your close-ups, you've established me. Why would I want to? Are you a coward? <laughs> yes, indeed, I am. <laughs> I, I have, I have learned through experience that explosions can go wrong. So if you don't mind, and so God bless them, behind this young, very inexperienced director, there were two producers going. <laughs> um, and I said, I tell you what, you, you, you can do this without me. So I'm going to go to the trailer now, and you can get the double. He's ready. He, that's how he earns his keep. He can do it. This disappointed the director immensely. I don't think he ever worked with me again. To be honest with you, now that I think about it, I'm not sure that he ever worked again. But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, he, he, um, the stuntman put the beard on and all that sort of thing. He, he jumped out of, the, out of the van. He spun, right in the face obviously. He spun, he ran towards the house. As he gets to the fence, the house burns, blows up, and he loses all the hair and skin off his face. The heat of it just melted. Melt, melted his eyebrows, melted his beard, the false beard, all that. And, uh, you know, it didn't hurt him, it didn't do major damage to him, but if it had been me, I certainly wouldn't have been able to work for a week and a half or something like that. And you just, you just you know, look at the director and say, now do you understand? <laughs> I, I remember working with a very great director. Um, uh, the, 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 the man who directed Patton, um, Lord, 
Um, anyway, we were doing a cavalry charge. Uh, and he said to me, Johnny, um, look, you know, you're about the only one of these actors who actually can stay on a horse. Do you think you can actually do this charge? And I said, yes, yeah, sure. But you know what? Um, I, I want to be in that, in that head-on shot. I want to be at least 100, 200 yards ahead because I've got 80 Italian stuntmen and 400 Arab doubles behind me. And if my horse goes down, I want to be able to get up and try and get out of the way. <laughs> he said, there's no problem. You're coming in the bush. It's a long shot. It's a charge about a mile across the plain. And, you know, I can, I can pick you up uh, and all that sort of thing. Fine. So we, we did the shot. And we did it two or three times. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now, Johnny, uh, I need to do a sign-on shot. Um, and so you can only be about 25 yards ahead. I said, you know what, sir, I think this is the time for the double. And he said, perfectly understand, perfectly understand. And, and, and uh, so I sat there and watched as my Spanish double, who was born in the set, I mean, just a magnificent rider. A stray horse cut across him, pushed his horse into a bush, he went off, and 400 horsemen rode over him. And you're sitting there and you're going, like that, and part of you is going, oh my God, and the other part of you is going, got that right, didn't I? <laughs> Arm out through there, knee out through there, split here, uh, and he, 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 the way all stuntmen are, he was all bravado, as he, I went and visited him in the hospital and bought him a bottle of punk, and I said, I'm awfully glad it was you, not me. He said, no, I'm not a no problem. <laughs> but you know, that's, it's a dangerous business, and and you and you have to be able to make uh, you have to be able to make the right call. Of course, when you when you're young, you sometimes don't make the right call, and, and with luck, you survive it. But I've known actors who do. Hmm. Anyway, sorry about that. That was completely off the point, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm getting rather good at that. Right. <laughs> Next person. Yes. 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 Somebody in the dark down here. First, thank you for being here, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mummy. Yes, sir. Uh, were you even approached to be in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? Uh, yes, I was, actually. Um, uh, the request went out um, for me to... They were going to send... I was working in Hungary at the time. And they were going to send a second unit director out and green screen it. I, I, I'm sure you're all film buffs enough to know about green, green screen. Um, and the idea was, uh, I came in, I sat down in a chair, I smiled and I clapped. And they were going to cut that into the wedding sequence. Um, and uh, I thought, you know what, that's very sweet to be remembered, but um, I, th I think the character of Salah is worth a bit more than that. You know, he's, And, and, and God bless him, and he's possibly the only, he's possibly the only heroic Arabic figure in, in, in Western film since about 1950 onwards. Um, so, you know, we had to do something for him. Um, so I, I said no, actually, so, um, so it really is my fault. But I don't, I don't regret it. I, 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 as I told, last time I saw Steven Spielberg, I said to him, so Steven, now let's see now. Four Indiana Jones films. One, fabulous. Two, okay. Three, fabulous. Four, okay. Now, what is it that's missing? <laughs> You haven't graced him off, anyway. <laughs> um, what a director. What a stunning director. And, um, but let me also make an observation that times have changed, and Spielberg has changed. The innocent young Hollywood director um, who did Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the nasty Nazis are really 
goofballs, really. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're stick characters. Uh, he, he himself has come to recognize the reality of evil um, by, you know, as, as his life has moved on and he's done show and, um, oh, those other heart-rending and racking um, stories about Nazism. And um, in a way, in, in a way, the very period, that very period, I don't think he can laugh as much about it now as he could when he knew nothing, you know, when he was a young man. And that's, that's very understandable. So perhaps that period is, is no longer really a period that we can, that we can cover. Subjects change, times change. And sometimes you need a change of actors too. <laughs> yes, next question. Hello, I have to say, the first time I saw you, uh, this is going back a ways, was as Maximilian Arturo. <laughs> Obviously, I loved you in the performance. Did that role hold any significance for you, and do you have any fond memories of that time? Well, <laughs> Max is a great character, by the way. You know, he's, he's, um, he's wonderful. Um, it was a tricky time because I, I, I'm rather fond of science, actually, and I'm rather, I, you know, I know some rather good scientists. I think it's a very, very important uh, study. And I didn't want to make it just the usual comic bad scientist. And, and that was explained to me. We, we were in conflict with it a little bit on, quite early into the show, you know. Basically, they said, look, John, all we wanted you to do is play the bad scientist in Lost in Space. And I said, well, if you told me that before, I wouldn't have bothered. And why would I want to recreate the bad scientist in Lost in Space? It's been done, it's been done quite well. You know, if that's the sort of formula you want, you're missing out on a great opportunity. Uh, I mean, you can have a character who is uh, vain, as Max Arturo is, immodest, as he is, but at the same time, I wanted to create a character displaying what I believe is one of the most important passions that all of you, all of us, should experience, and that is intellectual passion. The passion for ideas, uh, the, the passion for new thoughts and observations that change the way we look at things. And this is so important. In science, that's what good science does. On, on a basis of what we have accumulated and found to be true, we, we, we take another step, and then we have to look at everything we've done before in the light of this new ex discovery and see, see whether what we've done still stands, and modify it, think. It's a glorious thing. And when you meet, uh, as I'm sure you guys always do, because many of you are, are, are very, very bright people, um, that, that glorious thing when you meet a first-class mind. Uh, I, I've got a pretty good mind, but I have, in the course of my life, met people who were just off the Richter scale. And, and it is glorious to meet those minds. And this is a very anti-scientific society, an anti-scientific world. And there's sometimes good reasons for it. I mean, there may be more scientists living uh, than any other time in mankind's history, but I think there's an awful lot of bad science going on too. But really, we need good science. We need good scientific thinking. And I wanted to play Arturo uh, as a man who could think and was prepared to sort of make calculations uh, and, and, and stake his life and reputation on, on what he knew. Uh, and you know, 
I mean, for instance, there was, a, there was an episode where we were suddenly living in a world where magic worked, where, uh, where the young hero actually dies and comes back to life through magic. And, you know, I said to them, guys, if you want to do sword and sorcery stuff, you can do it, but, we, you know, the premise that we have set off is that it's good science that, you know, he's a brilliant young scientist. And more than that, if you kill somebody and then bring him back to life through magic, you can never again imperil people. You can't really have the level of suspense that you had before. Uh, and we, we were in, in, into a lot, of, uh, a lot of controversy over it. And, um, and I also found that what we were doing was repeating other people's shows. We did Night of the Living Dead. We did, uh, we did um, The Island of Dr. Moreau. We used the same masks that the film had used. You know, we did um, The Eloy and the Morlocks. We did Twister. We, you know, except that our twisters were different. You remember in Twister, uh, a twister starts small at the bottom and gets bigger like that. You know, like that. Our twisters were the other way around. We were big at the bottom, and, 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 and so it was quite a difference. Really. <laughs> uh, and in the in the end, you know, I I, I just had to say, guys, I, I want out of this. I, I had a I was I was in Westwood in Los Angeles, and a guy came up to me and he said, um, Mr. Davis, I, I just wanted you to know that um, I teach physics um, here at the university, and we always like to talk. Uh, it's a very useful thing to talk about the, the recent episode of, um, of Siders as a, as a good way of getting into things like relativistic time dilation and stuff like that. You know, are, are there any howlers in it? Why would this work? Why would this not work? And, and he said, I just beg you not to make science and scientists look stupid as it's very hard to get people to do science. And I took that to heart, and I do take it to heart. And in the end, in, in the end, my conclusion was that the people who were writing the shows had no knowledge of science, had no knowledge of um, science fiction. And you, you can't really write a good show like that. You know, you can sometimes come up with a good idea, but then you know, the idea that in an alternate universe, Cro-Magnon had triumphed and this sort of thing. When I saw that, you know, I, I was actually leaving the show at that point. I said, you know, great. What a great episode. You know, I trust it won't become a sort of, you know, a, 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 a route that we will now be doing 10 or 15 shows all based on that premise because, you know, it's, it's a one-show it's a one show premise. It's great fun, but no move on. So it, uh, there was a real sort of mismatch of purpose and intentions as far as I was concerned. And I'm, I'm, I'm sick at heart about it. I used to be furious, but I'm still sick at heart about it because we could have gone anywhere in space and anywhere in time. And uh, we could have done extraordinary things. We could still be on the air. And it was a waste of a great opportunity. I say, are you guys at the back able to hear anything I say? Right. Next question. Is it true that you disregarded some of the stunt coordinators for some scenes during Lord of the Rings and you just started going out swinging? against the other guys, and do you watch Cosmos? I would never, I would never uh, disobey a stunt coordinator. Um, <clears throat> all I can say is this, if you have as much armor and weight on as I had, imagine another 80 pounds added to your, uh, your weight in terms of the armor, and even when you're swinging a rubber axe, um, you, can't, you can't do that 
day in, day out, all day long, without swinging, uh, without ending up not being able to pull your shots. Um, but anyway, all those stunt guys, they were all well wrapped up and you know, <laughs> got armor on. And, and, you know, if, if one or two of those orcs got a bigger crowd than he was expecting, <laughs> Uh, they, were, they, they, they always like to talk about their bruises, but the buggers loved it really, you know. <laughs> Say what? Cosmos. Uh, the, the only Cosmos I knew was, was Carl Sagan's. Oh, have they? And, and it's sci sci fiction or something like that? It's the same. It's the same uh, oh, very good. It's very, the same concept. Very good. Very good. Well, yes, um, science is hugely important. I, actually, what's really interesting at the moment, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, um, there's a big, there's a big disconnect in the heart of physical science um, because something important like gravity or something, something enormous has to be revised. It, it, the picture is not complete and, uh, and it's very disquieting. Our, our vision of the universe is not, is not working out. And there have been lots of new revisions. I'm just reading a book by a man called Max Tegmark at the moment called My Mathematical Universe. Um, and there's a chap from Oxford who's just coming up with the theory of everything as well. Um, that's got to do with being an observer in the physical universe and how, how, how in a way you, you have to have an observer for anything to be observed. That is, if there's a scientist here, he's probably squirming in his, in, in his seat at the moment. Um, there's also an interesting thing by chap about biocentrism that I've been raising lately. Uh, and basically saying, look, our ideas of the universe are, are really wrong. Um, that in fact, the Ted Mark is basically saying the universe is mathematics. We are mathematics. Uh, the other chap is saying, look, the universe is organized and organizable around consciousness. Um, all of these are almost certainly wrong. But they but they what they indicate is that we're not happy with with the big picture that we've got. And, and by the way, um, my, the great Richard Dawkins, the the biologist and avowed atheist, um, I have to pick up a quarrel with him. Um, only because it seems to me that agnosticism, uh, you can understand agnosticism, that we, you know, the picture that we have of God uh, doesn't seem to be justified by what we know about the universe. It may be. I'm not saying that it is or anything, but agnosticism I can understand. But, you know, think about this now. We are a creature that has been sent. Well, let's really push it back. 500,000 years. Our species have been, what is what, 100,000 years old, something like that. Uh, we have a life expectancy of what? 70 plus or minus years. We live in a universe that is, what, 13 and a half, 14 billion years old. You know, we inhabit a, a small sun, uh, a, 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 a solar system around a small sun which is part of a, a very average-sized galaxy, the Milky Way. There are between 200 and 400 billion stars in our galaxy. There are between 200 and 400 billion galaxies in our universe. And if you believe the alternate universe thing, which 
may in fact does seem to be favored at the moment, then you know there are an almost infinite number of alternate universes. The number I saw about two years ago in New Scientist, three years ago in New Scientist, was 10 to the 500th power. That is a number that's bigger than all the atoms in our universe. The new number, I'm told, is 10 to the 1,000th power to the 10,000th power. Now, any of you who've done any quantum physics or anything like that know that if you've got enough space and enough time, from, from the quantum froth there will emerge an entire Volkswagen bus, which will come into existence and probably vanish in a, in a blink of a, of a very fast eyelid. Um, there are anomalies called Boltzmann brains. Boltzmann was a physicist who said, look, if this could happen, then entire intelligences could emerge and disappear. But if if, if somehow they could establish themselves or stabilize themselves, you might have a super intelligence that, that just came out of quantum froth, if you like. Uh, the problem with that is, given enough space and enough time, there should be a hell of a lot of them. And, and there may be super intelligences out there. There's not a great deal of evidence of it around here, is there? Um, uh, so all, all I'm saying is that uh, and the other thing is, look, the universe that we know, we only see 20% of it. You know, the rest we infer is there, dark matter and dark energy. You know, we, we inhabit a, a four-dimensional universe. That's what we understand, four dimensions. And yet we, can, we are living in a, what, 10, 11, 24, 25 dimensional universe. We do not have the equipment we cannot see and understand enough to see enough of a big picture to be able to declare flatly there is no God. It's an absurdity, uh, I would contend. Um, I understand the reason for wanting to say it. I understand that you, know, that, uh, that you can say, look, you do not need the intervention of God. If you go back to the Big Bang, you know, we have now unraveled the sequence of steps that happened uh, to get all the way to where we are now. But that's the explanation of a mechanism. Um, I, 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 I think it's hubristic to, for us as a species to stand up and say, on the basis of my 70 years on the planet and well, 12,000 years of, of semi-civilization and, you know, We've been around now for 50,000 years. Uh, we can say quite confidently there is no God. To me, that is factuous, but I am open to be persuaded otherwise. <laughs> By the way, if there are any men of science out there, or women of science out there, uh, who would like to flatly contradict me on any premise that I have used in any of these statements, please shoot me down. I, I, I'm more than happy to learn. And sometimes I get things wrong. Why don't I just put the other way around? Sometimes I get things right, but not often. <laughs> Two quick questions. First, um, I know that you're one of the tallest cast members in Lord of the Rings. Was it? unusual or did it influence your performance in playing one of the shortest characters? And would you be able to tell us about some of the pranks that you've been part of or victim of on set throughout your career? <laughs> Ever since I played Gimli the Dwarf, my career has changed utterly. I keep only getting offered the part of dwarves in rather strange pictures. <laughs> it's a little known fact that we dwarves are well, as they saw, here's to women who go swimming with wee hairy women. <laughs> Dwarves go swimming with wee hairy women. I, I, I have to tell you that um, the chance of playing a dwarf is so unlikely uh, in a man's life that uh, he should seize the opportunity <laughs> to find the inner dwarf. Um, 
And I, I, I love my inner dwarf. And, uh, but that said, uh, the, when the chance came to be in The Hobbit, I thought, I have been one of one, why would I want to be one of 13? Uh, and I do believe that uh, Peter, Peter Jackson himself is on record as having said that having worked with 13 dwarves, he certainly sees why uh, Walt Disney settled for seven. I love playing the dwarf, um, but that's that's done and dusted now. I think I'm, I, I'm over the dwarf now. Yes, next question. Um, I saw you on YouTube. You were at the set of The Hobbit. Um, did you ever get a chance to like mentor the other dwarves and to help them get into character? <laughs> well, poor buggers. Um, yes. Uh, no. The answer is no. Um, but you know, they wouldn't have welcomed it anyway. No actor wants to be taught how to play, uh, how to play a part by another actor. Um, I, when I met them, I did think, gosh, this is a cheat. They haven't got half as much makeup on. <laughs> uh, yeah. What about the eight hours a day I had with somebody putting makeup on my face, you know, and, and, uh, and all that? Uh, in fact, I think there was a panic in the studio and they, when they suddenly realized that The Hobbit was actually about dwarves. And they said, you can't have kind of pe people looking like John Rhys Davis as, as the hero in this damn thing. Uh, what are they going to do? And so basically, I think what they've done is the, 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 the leads are chosen to be rather handsome young dwarves and, and, and have minimal makeup on. And then the rest of the 13, well, they can have as much dwarfery as they, <laughs> they can get away with, really. Uh, so it's a little bit of a, a little bit of cheating and compromise, but um, I don't blame them for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> right.
and you can bet your boots that he'd be, he'd be looking forward to getting his revenge some way. Uh, and, and his own royalties would still be emerging. Uh, I think there is, I think there's a bit of a scandal about Salah, but I think that in the end, even at that period, when it was still very much the, you know, the loot and scoot for a school of archaeology, uh, that he had some sense of the importance of the past. Uh, yeah, I think he's, I think he's, a, he's an interesting character. Um, I, I'm, I really enjoy playing with him. Now, the good days, well, getting the job was a good day. Um, <laughs> the bad days, you mean, you mean that day when all of us have come down with uh, some strange Montezuma's revenge? <laughs> or the revenge of the Black Pharaoh, I suppose, or something like that. Anyway, yes, there was that, that terrible time when Stephen, in, in, in a bit of the film, I think you may now be able to see in the behind the scenes uh, of Ra uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, where it's a sequence where I'm going to be shot, uh, having been caught. It's cut out of the film because it's irrelevant, really. And Stephen said, uh, John, I'm really sick. You, you've heard of tunnel vision. It actually does happen. It, it, you have no peripheral vision at all. And the whole world is sort of like that. And you can see words coming down this sort of spiral tube to you. And you understand some of them, but not many of them. Uh, you have a temperature, your guts are hurting, everything's going on, you're throwing up and all that sort of thing. And Stephen is saying, uh, John, I want you to bend down to give him a better, uh, a better camera angle, a better angle to look at. And as I, as I do this, I fill my jalaba in front of 300 people. And I don't care. <laughs> I'm too far gone. My next memory is I'm, I'm, I'm waking up in this room. Uh, I have a temperature of 105 or something like that. I am dying. <laughs> I'm dying. I, have, I, have, I don't want to be too explicit here, but you asked. <laughs> this, this, this is the glamour of filming. I'm lying in this bed in which I both vomited and excreted. And I am dying. I have dysentery or cholera or something like that. I don't know what that means. And there's a knock at the door, and our little Australian doctor lady comes in. She lets herself in. And she comes in and she goes, Oh Christ, John! I see you've got it too! Can I use your toilet? Oh. <laughs> that little flame of life that had just come up a little bit was almost gutted out. So I thought, you know, if the doctor's ill as well, that's as if it's over. We, uh, I, I grew up in Africa. I used to have a pretty cast iron gut. But I have to tell you, I have never before or since experienced anything quite as catastrophic as that. Well, anyway, that's the glamour of filmmaking. Now, I'm sure, sure, sure you're really glad you asked that question. And I apologize for answering it so unnecessarily fully. Yes, next question. So my question is, what is something that you've loved more than anything else that maybe nobody or relatively nobody knows about? You mean apart from my daughter? Apart from me. Let me tell you children, the smartest thing we ever do is make babies. <laughs> it is the best thing we could ever do. And the sad thing about it is that when we're young, we're out to conquer the world, we're out to make a name for ourselves, earn money and this sort of thing. And for men in particular, and, and I know there are a lot of servicemen around here, and a lot of guys who have to live away from home, 
we go away from home to uh, to, earn, to earn the crust, and and we miss out on those day-to-day -day developments that just mark you know the, the the transformation from a completely defenseless baby to being a viable adult. And I really regret that. I I think. I think if I was going to change the world, I would have, I, I, I would have everyone's, how can I put this euphemistically and delicately and not offend the children in the audience as well, um, I would conserve the reproductive sources of the young and put them in a jam jar somewhere so that they could use them when they're a lot older. Um, Really, we, we actually become better parents when we're, when we're older. Uh, the problem is, of course, we can't, um, we can't play as much football or, or whatever it is uh, that we did when we were younger. But it, it's, it's wrong in a way that in order to live and to prosper, that we men have to go away and we miss out on, the, on, on our children. I have very few regrets in life, and one is that I didn't have more children. I have a beloved number one son, and uh, his name's Ben, and he's 45. I have a beloved number two son, and his name is Tom, and he's 43. And I have an eight-year-old daughter called Maya, who has taught me so much in my dotage that um, it, just, it just brought home to me uh, that, that this is really what it's about. Oh, and when I see those among you who've got, you know, 17 grandchildren and some great-grandchildren as well, they are the successful ones. I only have one grandchild. I would imagine that I won't have another grandchild for, in my lifetime anyway. Um, this means that I am not actually a very successful person. And... Uh, and in the end, I'm afraid it is that biological reductionism that matters. It's who you leave behind uh, as much as what you leave behind that counts. Sorry about that. We have time for one quick question, just under three minutes left. What's your name? I'm Tori. Very good. Uh, I loved you as Gimli in The Lord of the Rings, and I just wanted to know who won the battle between you and Legolas? <laughs> Tori, one of the terrible things that you will find out in life <laughs> is that elves cheat. Here's another thing to, you know, to put in your, your, your memory for you know, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Never fall in love with a man who is prettier than you. <laughs> one, of the one of the greatest. Well, you see, the truth of the matter is, I don't want to boast about it, but we dwarves are an exceptional people. Now, it's true we cannot walk on snow without leaving a mark. <laughs> that just tells you that they're light in their loafers. <laughs> and anyone can go... <laughs> but for we real wet work, you know, if you want to get down and at it properly, you need an axe. Yeah. It's all right standing at a distance and shooting poor innocent hawks and things like that. When you get up to them and see their big, ugly, smelly carcasses, 
I like to hack them behind the knees so they go down. I scramble the brains a bit. Uh, uh, yes. So uh, what you say, what, uh, what I'm saying to you is, is never believe anything uh, an elf tells you. Uh, they are uh, extraordinary key, you know, they, they, they have their capacities, they, they even have their loyalties, they have a capacity for friendship sometimes, but I've got to be a little bit careful with anything that lives essentially forever. Um, we dwarves have a very short dwarf uh, lifetime, you know. Uh, I, I myself can only manage about, you know, eight or nine hundred years, really, you know. It's not really a long enough, is it? But, um, and poor human beings, they, well, what do they know? What do they know? What can you possibly learn in 70 plus years? <laughs> anyway, uh, you, of course, are clearly elvish in extraction. <laughs> uh, that's a little elvish princess over there, I think. Anyway, my darling, um, the truth of the matter is, we both did a pretty good job, you know. <laughs> thoughts or whatever and if I have a, in some way offended or upset my apologies. Forgive me. Bye.